We're standing in front of the complex of Sultan Hassan. Can anybody tell me when it was built? Early 14th century? Not early 14th. Darn it. Early 14th would be a Nasser Muhammad. Okay. Late. And he's one of the descendants of a Nasser Muhammad. Uh, roughly about the middle, 1356 to 61. Whenever the plague is. <laughs> what was Sultan Hassan famous for? Hmm? For what? The entrance or not? Well, that's... Are you talking about the guy? Are you talking about the guy? I'm talking about the guy, yes. Oh. He confiscated a lot of money from the public treasury? Well, it wasn't that he confiscated it. It was that it, it arrived there without him having to do anything, in fact. Yeah. But he, he certainly used a lot of it, yes. Yeah. Uh, but militarily, politically... Uh, a lot of people died and there was probate. But again, he didn't kill them, so uh, you can't sort of... Black plague. Yes, now that's that's important, certainly, but uh, the interesting thing is that he is only famous for producing this building. He didn't expand Mamluk territory. He wouldn't, didn't win any great battles. So he, in a sense, had the good luck to be in power when the plague struck Egypt. Uh, thousands of families died and the money went into the public treasury. So there was a lot more to spend on building than was usual and he made good use of it as you can see. Do you remember the different parts of the complex? Many different functions do we have inside? Um, a mosque and a madrasa. There's a mosque and how many madrasas? There's like one for each of the four schools in law, right? Yeah, there are four madrasas in each of the four corners of the building. And what are we looking at here? Ne nearest to us on the, the left. This is the mausoleum. This is the part that juts out behind the Kibla Iwan into the Maidan. And why is that a, a good way to cite the different components? Or in particular the mausoleum. What's the advantage of being where it is? Gets the, the prayers. Two points. First of all, it's beside the prayer hall. In fact, right behind the prayer hall, uniquely for a Mamluk building. And it's open on yeah, it's open on three sides to passers-by. In fact, not just the one or two, perhaps that uh, we have in earlier buildings. So extremely advantageous. Uh, looking from this viewpoint, you can see that the portal is not aligned with the wall on the side of the building, but it's tilted a little bit. So in fact, from here you get a wonderful view from the uh, citadel angle and from this Maidan, which was one of the most important uh, parts of the urban fabric of Cairo at the time. So that's uh, an effective way of just advertising how important, big, rich your complex is and what a generous patron. Okay, we'll move inside. Have a look at the facade. And in class, we were discussing evidence for unfinished. the fact that it was unfinished. Yeah. So just have a look at that and tell me again which parts of it uh, are unfinished. This yeah, the lace ribbon is not finished. Yeah. This is one which was originally designed to have two minarets on top of it. There are several features of this building and the portal which have designs or forms reminiscent of Seljuk Anatolian architecture. The engaged columns at either side that you see that have the twisted rope molding on it. That's one of the motifs that you see in Seljuk architecture there. And when we go closer, we'll look at one a very dense geometric interlacing band, which is also typical of there. And many of the Anatolian portals do have twin minarets on them. But when this was being built, one of them fell down onto a maktab below and killed uh, dozens of children. So for some reason this was taken to be a bad omen and uh, 
uh, they yeah. stopped Could building the minarets at, at that stage, <laughs> yes. So the question is, uh, why did they fall? Perhaps they started to rise straight from the very top of the Iwan here. Mm -hmm. But in the Seljuk Anatolian examples, they are designed to go up slightly from the side so that they're partially buttressed by the top of the Iwan. And there really isn't any side portion here that they would have fit on easily. So perhaps this lack of understanding was what caused them to collapse. Uh, okay, let's go a little bit closer and, and look at the plan of the building. So, we're here at the moment. We've walked down from the side of the mausoleum, down this facade. Uh, as with other buildings, they want the interior to be parallel with the Qibla, even though the outer walls are on streets that aren't quite parallel, so there's a little bit of juggling with the sizes of the rooms and with the window niches at this point. But again, this, this twisting uh, uh, is partially perhaps because of the street, but also just to make uh, the portal more visible. Down at this end, there was a, a well with a sa'eya, with a water wheel, that provided water through... Uh, yes, there was also along here a Qaisariya, which would be a kind of lock-up bazaar. Um, you can still see some of the stalls, stalls at this end, although they're not marked on this plan. And the canal from the water wheel, uh, there's still part of it visible along the wall that's on the opposite side of the building. So the interior, uh, there were a doctor and a couple of nurses. This area has been totally reconstructed by the Comité in the late 19th century. We actually don't really know what it looked like completely originally. But uh, there were these medical facilities plus the ablutions area would have been in this portion originally. So we go from here into a vestibule. Uh, and of course, you always are given the possibility of entering ablutions facilities, first of all, before you go into the prayer areas. But that brings us into the for Iwan plan, which is described as a jana, as a congregational mosque in the Wakfeya. And it leads also into the mausoleum, which is described in the Wakfeya as a masjid. It had its own imam to lead the prayers. So that's another very effective way of ensuring that uh, prayers are offered in the mausoleum for the a uh, person who was supposed to be buried there. He, of course, we uh, <laughs> mentioned in class that his body was never found and so we don't know where he ended up after all that effort. And then in the four corners, you have the four madrasas. Uh, the two most common rites, the Hanafi and the Shafi, are the ones closest to the Qibla area and that have the largest courtyards. Each of these has a little courtyard with an Iwan. There's another one. That's the smallest one. Here, yeah. Yeah, that's probably the Hanbali, I think, yeah, which very few people belong to here. Let's just step back a second and look at the windows along here. So, yeah, how many floors do you think there would be here? Four. I think it's basically four. You can see that there's a, a basement that uh, starts up there, and as the level gets lower at this point, the basement is higher. But that combination of uh, one large and one small window represents one floor. So four floors in itself of, I mean, what's behind these windows? Rooms. For, 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 for the madrasas, exactly, yeah. yes. This is where the students lived. It's also worth looking at the, the shape of the niches. This uh, very plain, almost repetition of rectangular niches all the way along the facade. Uh, this is something that you find in some of the first skyscrapers in America in Chicago built by Lewis Sullivan. And the thought is that he could have seen a reproduction of photographs of this building when he was planning them. But even if he hadn't, in many ways, it's a very modern aesthetic. It does look like uh, a lot of early 20th century buildings.
uh, and no less impressive for that. Okay, we're going to go up the steps and then stop and look in detail at some of the ornamentation that we have there. How did uh, Sultan Hassan die? What? He was killed. He didn't die a natural death. So after he died, some work on the complex carried on, but a lot of it stopped where it was. So we saw evidence for the major unfinished portions and here is more evidence as well. You have some of the stone decoration where you have just the outlines carved in very light relief. Now these were going to be carved much deeper. Same with those. This is the depth of the carving that there should have been originally. But I also want you to look at this carefully and tell me what sort of style it's in. Chinese style? Yes. This is very much one that has the, the Chinese lotus and the peony leaves. Mm -hmm. So this is actually uh, the most impressive example in carved stonework and Cairo architecture of motifs that copy the Chinese ones very closely. And you can maybe just see from here on the corresponding part on the opposite side of the door it's not carved in depth. They just have the outlines of the design done. So if you have a look at this motif, for instance, and this one, there's just the outline of it. And on the other side as well, you just have the outline. So that's another good piece of evidence for the incompletion of the original. Uh, here we have another little band of chinoiserie decoration mm -hmm. this chinese style mm -hmm. but you can see that it stops it actually was supposed to go up all the way around the outline of this niche so he, he, he put a lot of styles different styles yes yes and uh there's all trying to show off <laughs> oh, for sure <laughs> for sure <laughs> that's like that's the case with uh, most Thank architectural you. patrons Yes, even Mokarnas on the, on the bench here, which is beautifully done. Most of the stone that's used in this portal is uh, marble rather than limestone. This motif. This is the very dense geometric interlace that I was talking about, which <laughs> is one that you only find otherwise in Seljuk architecture in Anatolia. You don't find this in any other building in Cairo. So it's more good evidence for the fact that the architect had seen some original buildings but probably wasn't uh, uh, imported himself from there <coughs> since we've seen the lack of understanding of the uh, positioning of the minarets which might have caused them to fall. Now you have a, an inscription in beautifully designed Nasch running around just below the, the Mokarnas, the stalactites. It's Quranic, it's the uh, part of the verse before the Ayat al Kursi. And what do you have in, in colored marble below it? Yes, yes, you have the Shahada in square Kufic, the same kind of Kufic we saw used in the Khalawan complex. So, another very effective piece of design there, but they obviously reserve it for something that you can read very easily understandably. The shape of this lozenge, it's one that you find in many contemporary Qurans. And if you remember, I mentioned in class, in Quranic illumination. Yeah. There are lots of uh, very, very finely illuminated Mamluk Qurans. Uh, you can see some if you go to the Dar al-Qutub, for instance. Is this the book design or that? Uh, uh, that's what they call it in, uh, in Arabic, uh, Bukhariya, yes. Bukhari. It's, uh, central medallion uh, which is usually symmetrical though on, on both sides not not the single teardrop like this and corner medallions on the corners that's also used for book bindings and we saw some in the doors in Bar -u in the last semester but the signature of the Shad al Amar, the supervisor of the works of the building is present in one of the four madrasas and it's uh, Muhammad ibn Bilik who also has a signature 
on a Quran of the same period. He, although he was a Mamluk Amir, he was also an expert calligrapher, unusually. And it's thought that the unusual amount of decoration that is similar to Quranic illumination is because he was partially responsible for the design of these elements. So that's a surprising feature. Uh, I mean, there's other fabulous marble carvings, such as these two panels on both sides of the entrance to the door. Uh, the doors look very plain. Why is that? They're not original. Because they're not original. Where are the originals? It's in another mosque here. Yeah. They're in another mosque, yeah. yeah. It's another sultan who, who fancied them for his own building, to sort of not quite borrowed them. He did pay a price for them, but obviously, or not obviously, but it was much less than uh, what they were worth. You don't steal something and move it to the building across the street? <laughs> yeah, you move it a little bit further away. I mean, there was a, uh, a contemporary historian, Makrizi, who wrote most about the architecture, who described the Mamluks as thieves stealing from thieves. So oh, okay. here's an appropriate example of it. Al Mu'ayyid was the name of the Sultan who took it. His mosque is just behind Babzuela. There used to be a prison, and it exactly, exactly. Yeah, he built a mosque, so uh, that's what is there now. <laughs> and uh, he put the, the two minarets on top of Babzuela as well, which make it an even more impressive landmark. So if you're in that area, stop and you can always see the doors even if the mosque isn't open. Okay, we need to go in. He wants to see our... Lounge. This inlaid panel is particularly striking with different colored marble, mostly red and white. It's very like others that were being made in Syria at the time. It's in uh, Damascus in particular that we have the closest parallels for this. And this was such a huge building project that it's likely that craftsmen came from all over the Mamluk world. So we get uh, as well as examples of Anatolian influence, we also have Syrian influence. It's possibly been restored. Yeah, there are some slight variations in the color, but I think even in the original stone, it may not have been exactly the same shade. Mm. So, I mean, I never thought of this as being heavily restored before. Uh, it's, it's in a part of the building that wasn't subject to weathering, so it, it may not actually have, uh, have changed that much. Uh, it's also worth looking at the other carved stone patterns here. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, uh, an extremely delicately carved medallion which has many layers. You have uh, an outer layer of this intersecting bands connected to arabesques, but below it you have yet another layer of arabesques, vegetal ornamentation in the background. And there's a very different type of design in the center. What type of leaf is this in the middle? The, the leaf design that you have here. These leaves are very different from the ones that are used in the other part of the medallion. No, they're not. Uh, no, these are surprisingly archaic at this stage. They go back to a much, a much earlier style in Islamic architecture. These are more like acanthus leaves, which uh, the Romans used and which you have in the Umayyad period as well. So just why they're being revived here, I'm not too sure. There's a rectangular panel above it. Uh, we've seen the, the type of geometric interlacing stars often enough, but there's something different about this. It doesn't have any specific shape. Well, it has a specific shape. You're, you're, you're voicing something which is Correct, but if you can put it in another. And it's not symmetrical. It's not symmetrical around a vertical axis. Yes. But if you come back here. It's symmetrical from a horizontal axis. It's symmetrical from a horizontal axis, yes. 
but also just just come over here compare it with the corresponding panel over there it's a mirror image so if you're down there in the decibel looking at them both at the same time you do get a feeling of symmetry in a different way so it's very carefully thought out uh, and another interesting square panel on the side. What's uh, unusual about that? There's two things because there are three on the other one. There actually are six of these, except only two of them have the uh, the carving and depth. In this one, three of them have the carving and depth. The ones that aren't in depth don't have the same. They don't have the same design. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But it is the same pattern overall on, on both. Mm -hmm. But another interesting aspect of the pattern is that instead of the, the straight lines that we normally have for geometric patterns it's that make it up, mm -hmm. they're all curved here. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, an unusual feature as well. It's such a wonderful building. It has four Iwans. What else about it is like Barkuk? This this and, uh, ablution uh, dome in the center of the courtyard. Right. What other element the, is similar to Barakuk? The mimbar. Not the, not the mimbar. It's it's the marble. Yeah, the dikka. The dikka. Like, the dikka. Oh, okay, the dikka. Dikka is the name of it. And that's because they were specifically copied in the 19th century by Max Hertz, the restorer of Barakuk, uh, because he thought they'd look pretty, I suppose. <laughs> So, uh, it's not just coincidence that uh, some of them are the same. Mm. So, in terms of size, this is easily the most impressive of Mamluk buildings, particularly in the courtyard. Although there's also a, a reason why the Kibla Iwan is so big. Uh, do you remember what the patron Sultan Hassan particularly wanted bigger than, bigger than the Taki Kisra. Yeah, is this bigger than the Taki Kisra? No, no, it's not. It's slightly smaller, but uh, the Taki Kisra was in Ilkhanid territory, so unlikely that anyone went to measure it. Sultan Hassan certainly never got there to figure out that it actually was a little bit smaller. So all of the lamps that you see hanging down from the ceiling now, these are modern replacements, but when we go to the Museum of Islamic Art, they have many original lamps on display and uh, quite a few of the originals in the collection came from Sultan Hassan. Okay, the lintel over the door. Oh, okay, you're looking at the date. What's the date? <laughs> 1332. Well, I thought this was built in 1356 to 61. Uh, that's, that's the Hijra date for the restoration. That's the Hijra date of the Comité, of the restoration group, exactly, yes. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second, but <laughs> what, uh, what kind of technique is the lintel made of here? Juggling voussoirs. So, just hold that for a second. Oh no, you can take your photograph. No, I don't need to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the yes. juggling is done on a horizontal, horizontal level, so they, they can't move up and down at all. But if you have a look at the bottom, at the keystone, the central stone, you'll see that there's a little fleur de lis coming out of the center, juggling it. Oh, yeah on the plane at right angles. Mm. Sorry, it, the, the first one is juggled vertically, this one is juggled horizontally. So how did they fit them together? Because it's impossible, you can't. <laughs> it, it's just like a thin layer. That's what I thought too. But here in fact you can see that there's part of the stone missing of the central black stone. Uh -huh. and it doesn't look like a thin air, it looks like it's one solid block rather than being a thin veneer as we've had in so many other okay. examples. Well, maybe it's just a shallow carving. Or not, I don't know. But, uh, but 
Well, we can't tell from here how shallow it is, but the, the rest of the stone is solid, so... No one's figured I mean, that. You can't, you know, there isn't a line where they've stuck on a little bit extra. Mm. Well, a student actually made a model for me once, although it was just a fiberglass and it was a larger scale, which uh, showed that you could have it coming in at a 45 angle degree. I don't know if that's what they actually used here. Nobody has ever completely convincingly explained this mystery to me. <laughs> but it, uh, it remains one of the most intriguing aspects of the design of the whole complex. Oh yes, I also wanted to mention about the, uh, the shape of the ablutions fountain. You can see it has a wooden bulbous dome on top. There was a 17th century traveler, an Italian traveler, who described the dome over the mausoleum as being shaped like an egg. So it too originally was probably a bulbous one that very likely was made of wood. But like the, the Kalon and the Borokok examples, they also restored it with masonry. Still surviving. Who can read the beginning of this inscription for me? Very good. Uh, so I take refuge in God from Satan the cursed. There is no. No, it's 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 kufik. It's kufik. So they don't do dots in kufik. <laughs> Just to annoy you. Uh, yeah, now you're forced to guess. <laughs> yes. But it's a common phrase, actually, so it's easy to recognize, and the, the continuation of it is a Quranic inscription. It starts with the Basmala. But it's... <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's actually very rare in Cairo to have this introductory phrase to a Quranic inscription. And the thinking is that the stucco inscription that goes all the way around the Qibla Iwan was probably designed to go all the way around the four Iwans and along the courtyard as well. Mm. Wow. But they ran out of money when so they built it. So to just give a sense of completion, they maybe added this phrase at the beginning and another one at the end. Uh, and that was as much as they could do. <laughs> Sure, sure, but let me just uh, let me just talk about something else because there's a in addition to this Quranic inscription, there's another inscription here somewhere. Have a look on at the stucco inscription and see if you can find it. Oh, on the side. Uh, yeah. Oh. But it's not complete. Like it's, no. Uh, no, it might it's be a signature. Signature. It's it's signature. It is signature. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yes, it doesn't look that's like. Time. Yeah, it's like. It's yeah. There is a, uh, yeah. part of the uh, award or something, and then. And then it changes into design. So yeah. he took only as much space as was necessary to sign his name. It begins with Amal. And that's actually oh. very unusual in Cairo. Oh, it is. It is. It's a, it's, it's a signature. It uh, hasn't been completely read, but it starts Amal. It's something like uh, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and it ends uh, Al Yamani. Al Yamani is, is the Nisba. It doesn't necessarily mean that he came straight from Yemen. You can get a nisba from by lineage. His family could have come to Cairo before and he could, still could have been trained here. So uh, We're going to look at the inscription again. We can see it much better here. The material it's made of is... Yeah, I'll tell you what, just... Yeah. So what... Uh, it's, it's a Quranic inscription. What, what's the material? Stucco. It's made of stucco. It's carved stucco. And the style of the script is Kufic. But it's an interesting one in which uh, a lot of the tops of the letters are at a 45 degree angle. It's a style that's called sometimes Eastern Kufic because a lot of Qurans that were written in Iran are in this style. At this stage, it's very, very rare to find a large inscription like this in Kufic. Uh, most of the Quranic inscriptions too are written in Nasr. So this may be another indication of the hand of um, uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Bilik al Mosini, who was the Shah al Amayar, whose signature is found in the other courtyard of the Hanafi uh, 
madrasa and who himself was a calligrapher uh, and presumably participated in the illumination of the Qurans he was working on as well. Have a look at the base of the uh, of the column that's part of the dikka here. Just have a look, however, at the little moulding that you have here and tell me what style it is. Yeah, another example of these uh, little Chinese lotuses that we have on the on the outside of the building. So there are quite a few of it here. I used to tell people, because this was frequently referred to as the Dekadar Mubalach, what, what did the Mubalach do? Announce? <laughs> 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 he uh, repeated uh, the, uh, ah. the, the prayers, yeah. but mm. the, the idea used to be that he was somebody whose actions you could see, and so people uh, could follow his actions yeah. clearly in the courtyard, say. But then it was pointed out to me by Doris Berhans Abu Saif, who's our greatest expert on Mamluk architecture, that it's always called in the Waqfiyat Tikad al Mu'ezzanin. But, but if you're giving a call to prayer from here, who's going to hear you? <laughs> hmm? Nobody outside the building, that's for sure. So it's for a special call to prayer, the Aqama, which is given for those who are inside the mosque. So come up close here to the uh, Mihrab niche for a second. We have Allah in three niches at the top, which looks like it has uh, oh, well, almost lightning-like uh, rays coming from it towards the uh, juggling at the top. And then below the inscription, we have more of these little dwarf columns, which the fashion was started for in the Qaloon complex like in the really Mihrab. Flat. And they're flat in this case, that's right. They're not, uh, not quite not as impressive. Marbles, like in I think it might be made of marble, but they've, they've painted them in this gold paint recently. Mm -hmm. So I think mm, probably all the revetment here is marble, but uh, mm -hmm. the painting, you can see, in fact, makes it much easier to pick out the design. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the case with all the other examples of marble that we've seen as well. But what isn't of wood here is also interesting, and that is the mimbar. This has a very impressive Mokarnas portal leading up to the steps. The whole entrance is made more impressive by this very elaborate molding, which is also something very unusual. Uh, and the, uh, the revetted doors with bronze, which again, I don't know from any other mimbar in Cairo. And we have lots of these wonderful doors. This is the best of all. This is the door that leads to the mausoleum. And it would have had two doors like this originally. The other one has disappeared. There's a sign. So, so in the middle, what's, what's in the middle? I presume it's part of an inscription that, that is uh, in praise of the patron. That's what you would expect to find here. What's the material of that? Inlay. That's gold inlay, and uh, the the silver so color is is actual silver inlay as well. Here too, if you look carefully at the the big knockers, it's it's a unique shape for door knockers. There isn't another one like them. In addition to these uh, bosses, can you see the design that is between the bosses, the circular bosses? Oh, no. yes, more Chinese lotuses. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of show offs, this is. Another example of the one we saw in Barkuk. In Barkuk, exactly. They probably. The so big. Yes, they did have Qurans that big. And I, again, if you go to the Dar al uh, they I think they do have some on display at the moment, although well, I haven't been there in a while. Uh, and this one, unlike the one of Barkuk, this has inlay, which is also carved as well as just being uh, markedly flat. Instead of the flat portions of Barkuk, this is much finer uh, carving. Uh, very thick window embrasures, and according to the Waqfaya, like Qal'un, there were teams of Quran readers who, 24 hours a day, read uh, for the benefit of the passers-by and so forth.
It's a typical feature of mausoleums versus the other prayer areas of complexes. The mausoleums are the parts that receive the finest decoration. Above the marble dado, you have an inscription. It's in bulbous. Uh, it, it, this is made of carved wood, which is then painted. Wow. The design of the inscription, the thing that's different about it is that it looks squashed to me. No. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they usually, the size of the letters in regard to the height of the frame is very big. And it makes it easier to read, but it, it just doesn't look that elegant, unfortunately. Uh, so above that we have, yes, the lighting brackets, which also had very fine painting on them. And then above that again, what's the zone of transition made of? Yeah, more cornice pendentives, and these also have fabulous painting on them. Yeah, uh, and it, it, it looks original. Most of the marble here, as far as I can see, hasn't been uh, restored. We're here in one of the four madrasas, in the Hanafi madrasa in particular. Hanafi and Shafi, they were the most important, uh, mostly Hanafi, and this is the biggest of them all probably. So each of them has a small courtyard with a single iwan, little undecorated niche indicating the Qibla. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's this one that has the uh, uh, the name of the Shadal Amar, uh, Muhammad ibn Bilik al Mosini, who was responsible probably for not just overseeing the construction of the building but for much of the decoration as well. And you can see that this is the same style of Eastern Kufic script exactly as was used in the main Qibla Iwan. So here's another good view of the uh, many stories. Four four stories of cells that we have surrounding the Iwan which we use for accommodation. Uh, so each of the four madrasas has this light shaft coming in for the courtyard uh, in front of the Iwan. Just watch out for the rats and the, and the bats. <laughs> Remember, there were four minarets originally. There were supposed to be the two over the doors, but they were, they were dropped. Uh, this one is a later Ottoman addition. Mm -hmm. This is the only minaret from the original building that survives. And it's the, the tallest single Mamluk minaret in Cairo. Uh, three octagonal stories, but interesting design at the top. It has these mokharnas that have <coughs> projecting elements, they look like little spikes around the top. Yeah, I saw similar spikes at the medallion in the... Yeah. In the mausoleum, yeah. that's right, yeah. So, same kind of idea, they don't actually uh, have any masonry above them, they're just purely decorative at that point. Uh, you also get a great view here of the, the, the domes and the minarets of the Rafa'i Mosque across the road. And uh, you can see the outside of the dome better, so all of that top part is new masonry construction that was added by the committee to replace the original wooden bulbous dome that they had there. <laughs> 